Okay, so that is our story analysis. Tests, allies, and enemies is the step where they're kind of just getting to know the world and meeting their enemies and their allies and being tested. So the inciting incident of the ending payoff is Hagrid tells them how to get past Fluffy. Just kind of in a in a conversation there in the pub, he says, oh, you play a wee bit of music. Hey there, I'm Nicole. Welcome back to my AuthorTube channel. So today I am super excited. I am talking about story structure and specifically the Google form <laughs> that I created to help myself analyze story structure. There are a gazillion different ways to analyze story structure and I have relied a lot on three books, especially when planning my current project. They are The Writer's Journey by I think it's Christopher Vogel, The Anatomy of Story by John Truby, and The Story Grid by Sean Coyne. They all use a different vernacular and they all have different strengths and weaknesses. For the first time when I'm drafting something, I feel very confident in the story structure. Part of the, how I came to that realization was just studying a lot of other stories, movies, books, whatever, and thinking through them. And I want to continue doing that. And I want to continue doing that in a way that is cogent and a way that is fairly standardized. Thus, the Google form was born. Basically, what I've done is I've combined elements from all three of those things, the story grid, the writer's journey, and the anatomy of story to be kind of a mega structure, not plot beats, but everybody says they're not plot beats. I don't know if they are or not, but like mega structure through which I can analyze whether certain elements are there or not and compare stories based on a, a more solid metric. So I'm going to explain today a couple things. I'm quickly gonna run through the basic, super basic three minutes or less core of those three methodologies because otherwise, if you don't know those, the video won't make sense. There will be a timestamp below for if you're already familiar with those and you just wanna keep going. Then I'm gonna explain my form by showing you the analysis that I did for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I am not suggesting that anybody take my Google spreadsheet and use it to plot their own stories. This isn't a methodology, this is just how I think about story structure now, I'm sure it will evolve and change. And by understanding how other people think about story structure, I benefit and gain deeper insights into how to write a good story. So I hope that's what this video is for you. Uh, this is The Writer's Journey by, yeah, it is Christopher Vogler. Look at me. Good job. The Writer's Journey book is about the hero's journey, which is a, the following, basically. You have three acts. In the first act, you have the ordinary world, which is the world as the hero knows it, boring, mundane, you know, village. Then you have a call to adventure, Gandalf arriving at the door, um, someone needs to go get food because we don't have any, so someone needs to go into the mountains that kind of thing, uh, that's the inciting incident. Then you have the refusal of the call where the hero, due to their inherent weaknesses, says, nope, I'm not gonna do that. And then the hero goes and meets with the mentor, which is some white haired guy. This is just typical hero's journey. It was just some white haired guy, or if it's a rom-com, maybe it's their friend and they're having a glass of wine. And she's like, no, go for it, date the guy. And the bearded guy with white hair is like, no, I have been over the mountain and I believe in you because you can also go over the mountain. And then uh, they accept the call <laughs> and cross the threshold from the ordinary world into the extraordinary world. Test allies and enemies is the step where they're kind of just getting to know the world and meeting their enemies and their allies and being tested. You know, there's a whole book on this entire graphic that explains it. So if you really want to know the, the, the intellectual bit of this and not just my quick like retelling, I, I encourage you to, to, to read it. Um, <laughs> then there's the approach. Now this is interesting. This is where I stop liking the hero's journey that much, but it's, um, it's pressing into the heart of the world. So there's lots of obstacles here where the hero is making their plans. You can see courtships here. You can see studying for the test, stalking the prey, adventurers squeeze in a love scene. They're moving towards the heart of this extraordinary world. In tests, allies and enemies, they've kind of learned about it and understood the basics of how it works. And now they're going forward into the heart of it. That's the approach. Then we have the central ordeal, midpoint, death, rebirth. Basically, the central ordeal is when it looks like the opponent has won. Thus, the hero experiences some sort of metaphorical death. 
and then rebirth, where the hero learns something new or something that changes the, what the hero is doing so that they now know how they can win and they start fighting back. So the central ordeal is like they meet the opponent or there's something with the opponent or something happens, you know, they, and it looks like they can't win because they've been going, they've been doing it wrong all along and they've been losing, 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 and now they really lose and it looks like they can't win, but then something happens and they are rebirthed and they realize they can win if they just change this one thing. And thus, they continue going with their <clears throat> reward, <laughs> which is um, that <laughs> I love that the chapter monograph or whatever you call it is we came, we saw, we kicked ass. Yeah, they came, they saw, they kicked ass in the central ordeal. And now our hero has the tools that they need to beat the villain. You could also think of this as seizing the sword or seizing the tools, the tools to truly move forwards and beat the villain. They gain new knowledge. They're really working towards it now. Then they have the road back. Again, this confuses me because I feel like the road back indicates the person is like already going home, but that's not already the case. So it's just kind of the naming here that I don't love a lot, but obviously tons of people use the hero's journey, so far be it for me to criticize. It's just kind of what fits in my head, but this is what it is. Basically, you're still in the basement of the story, you're still in the belly of the dragon, and you have to push towards the light. So this is a point where we see a lot of chase scenes. There are new goals formed. That's on the road back. We're still moving forward. We have a slightly new destination. It's like we know where the villain is and we're going there. For some reason, I'm sorry for all the Harry Potter references. I'm really sorry. I keep thinking of Harry Potter 7 when I think of this and how he's like walking through the forest and that's kind of his road back. Gosh, JK Rowling did this whole thing so well. Cause then comes the resurrection. Oh, spoiler alert for Harry Potter seven, but that's exactly what happens. We have our road back where like, we're going towards the villain. We're going to the heart of where the villain is. We're gonna have like a big conflict there. And then we have our resurrection, which is the climax, the most dangerous meeting with death, the showdown, the final attempt at the big change, the running through the airport, the whatever. And then we finally return with the elixir, which is we re-enter the ordinary world with skills or knowledge that we didn't have before. So that is the hero's journey as explained in the writer's journey. All right, now let's talk for a minute about the story grid. The story grid, the core concept that I use from the story grid, I mean, I use a lot of it, but like the corest concept in this form <laughs> that I have are the five commandments of story grid, which are, you have an inciting incident, progressive complications, crisis, climax, and resolution. So let's quickly zip through what those things are. Inciting incidents, pretty straightforward. You have things at a certain level, we establish that as writers, and then I think of inciting incidents as a disturbance. Something changes, something jiggles, something throws it off. Your little Rube Goldberg machine, you like push the ball, the button to start the machine and things start going. And that's what hits off that sequence of events that can't be stopped. Also the game Mousetrap, right? The game Mousetrap where you, the, the mouse hits the, no, the ball hits the thing. And then the, all the stuff starts falling and you're like, oh no, is it going to get my mouse? Yeah. That's the inciting incident. It can be casual or coincidence. I like to think of it as either like an action that the story, the character takes or a casual like coincidental event, like an action or a revelation. That's probably what that means. I just go, go, I'll link it below. <laughs> then we have progressive complications. These are actions and story events that raise our stakes. So, you know, we, we, we had our little inciting incident. Maybe we're, you know, we're, we've decided that we're going to cross the border with smuggling drugs or something. This is, this is through my head because this isn't a story that I was thinking about earlier today, but we have our progressive complications here. We're trying to smuggle something across somewhere. And that was, you know, we, we set off with our car, we got to the border and maybe that's kind of our inciting incident and progressive complications come as active turning points, which is through character actions or another character says, come over here. We're going to inspect your truck. Um, or revelatory turning point, which is they get information such as if you get caught, you're going to go to jail for 20 years. Ooh, 
That's a progressive complication. It just raises our stakes. Make sense? Yeah. Progressive complications raise the stakes in the story. They're events that keep complicating what the character wants, making it harder and making those stakes go up. And then eventually, one of those progressive complications is a tur big turning point that propels us to the crisis. And the crisis is when the hero has a decision to make. So say we're doing this weird border smuggling example again. And so they, you know, they've been called over to the side. There's the police officer waving at them. They f suddenly found out that if they get caught, they'll have 20 years in jail. They're like, oh my God. And they say, you know, open your trunk. And our protagonist has a choice. They could either turn around and zip the hell away from the border, or they could say yes and let the um, border agent or whoever it is search their car. Uh-oh, crisis, big, scary moment. It's in always in the form of a question. I always write these in the form of the questions. It's either a best bad choice, i.e. what I just, just described, or irreconcilable goods, like you could go to the Mexican restaurant or you could go to the chicken wing restaurant, but you cannot go to both. Crisis. And then there's the climax, which is when the hero is acting on their choice, it's the active answer to the question in the crisis. So they're, they're in the battle. They choose to go fight or they choose to say those words, argue with their boyfriend or, or whatever. It's the climax. They're acting on that choice. Whatever the crisis was, the crisis is the question. The climax is the answer. And then you have the resolution. So the resolution is when we are kind of at a new equilibrium, a new settling down point that can be disturbed later, but for for the basis of however long this sequence of five was, we're now at a ha huh point where we, we're, we're at a new normal. I don't think taking a little breath is actually a good way to describe it because the resolution could be now they're running through a forest trying to get away from the border people but they're they're now doing that that's like their new activity and that's going to be like their steady activity for a while that could be the resolution to the scene it, or it could be another question like there's a huge bomb dropped in the revelation you're like oh my god this changes the entire story so it's not necessarily a boring beat resolution sorry it's not necessarily a boring beat, but it's the moment when like that mouse trap lands on the mouse and everything is still, even if it's just for a second. Okay, and now we're talking briefly about the anatomy of story. I'm gonna throw up the 22 structure steps in the anatomy of story just on the screen here. Really quickly, I guess the things that we should think about, the, the structure steps, I don't know necessarily, like number one is weakness, need, and self-revelation. I don't know if these are necessarily in the order that they need to be presented. It's just the structure of things that you must have. I feel like the order is very, very fluid. The first step that I just wanted to explain that doesn't seem self-explanatory. So revelation, you see like first revelation and decision, surprising new information that the hero gets. It forces our hero to change direction and make a new decision. So a revelation is a turning point that drives a crisis such that we have new action. It's not a bend, it's not a break of the desire line. They don't say, you know, I wanted to win the dancing competition, revelation, nope, now I wanna win the cooking competition or whatever. That's not how it works, it's more just like a bend. It's like, okay, I wanna get into studio A to do dancing and then it's, oh, I've heard of this great new teacher who has spots, now I wanna work with that teacher kind of deal. And it's fairly straightforward. The hero comes up with a plan. Woohoo, fun. The opponent has a plan. This is usually hidden from us. Then we have the drive, which is the hero acting on their plan, performing actions to defeat the opponent and win, but they're losing to the opponent the whole time. You'll notice this is kind of like the approach. So they're kind of the same thing, the drive and the approach, drive and anatomy of story, approach in hero's journey. We then have apparent defeat, which is surprisingly the same as the central ordeal in the hero's journey. And that's when it looks like the antagonist is winning. We're done for. That sucks. 
I really like what the anatomy stuff story does next though. There is usually another revelation. They get new information that propels the hero out of the apparent defeat to the obsessive drive where they now have the tools. They know how to defeat the villain and they go after it at like a super type way. It's like obsessive now. Another great thing about the anatomy of story that neither really the story grid or um, hero's journey covers the way that anatomy of story does is the moral aspect of it. So this anatomy of story has a few really good guidelines. It's that the hero and the opponent should have the same goal. The hero and the opponent should both have moral weaknesses, not just weaknesses where like, you know, a weakness of the character could be like, they have a low self esteem Steam, they're not very good at math. A moral weakness is a weakness where it's hurting someone other than the hero. So what the anatomy of story does is they suggest that the hero is an immoral in some aspect of their life person. And through the drive, they are losing because they are being immoral. Then at apparent defeat, it's kind of the worst part. The apparent defeat brings them to the next step of their kind of moral journey. And then at the end, they have a moral revelation where they realize that they have been hurting people and they have to change their decision and they show that with a moral decision, which connects to the overall thematic idea of the story. I really hope that made sense. It makes sense to my brain because I've read that book like 5,000 times, but basically the hero has like a moral weakness at the beginning that means they're hurting someone else. Through the course of the story, it gets worse. At a certain point, they realize that they are hurting others and that they have to change. The moral decision demonstrates that change. And then you can have a thematic revelation that comes from that, that shows your vision of how to act in the world. I love it, I love it. So these are amazing um, frameworks that I have I have co-opted into something that makes sense for my brain because I do have all of these in my brain when I'm trying to plot a story. So I thought it would be helpful, especially when analyzing a story that's like a movie or a novel or whatever, to have them smushed together and try to understand how they get smushed together. So let's go through this and I'm gonna talk a little bit about like what every step means and how I created it and why and I don't know if anybody's gonna watch this video because this is so nerdy, but it's fine. It's, it, this is fine. So title, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I have a, a section for the medium. It would be super interesting at some point if I do enough of these analyses to look at differences between different mediums. I put script on here because I wanna do A Cursed Child so bad because that is the worst thing I've ever read in my life and I wanna see if it hits the structure steps. We're getting off track. Okay, who is the protagonist? Harry Potter. Okay, what are they like at the beginning of the story? I like this question because it helps us establish character change. It's part of uh, Friedman's framework, which is basically just tracking how characters change in power, status, and ability over the story. So for example, at the beginning of Harry Potter, he has little power, he lives in the cupboard under the stairs, his status is super low, he has these like interesting abilities, he do crazy magic and stuff, but like he doesn't know that and he doesn't have any training. What is our story world? I put that in there as kind of a, a reminder. A story world could be a lot of things. With Harry Potter, it's pretty clear that it's like Hogwarts. Um, it could be the world of theater. It could be the world of dating. It could, eh, lots of things. So beginning hook, before I do this, I'm just gonna explain that I think of story in four acts versus three. It's, it's kind of like three with like a two part middle. That's what they talk about in the hero's journey as well as the story grid now, that it's four acts, which makes a lot more sense to my brain. Our ordinary world story world beginning is Vernon Dursley's life in the English village, village, which is super ordinary. We then get a glimpse into the wizarding world when Dumbledore arrives. And this was super important for establishing magic early on, because otherwise I think the book wouldn't have worked if we didn't get that little early glimpse. Thank you, JK Rowling. All right, we have the weakness, need, and the ghost. So ghost is what like haunts the character, obviously. And that is generally driving their weakness and need. So Harry's ghosts are he's an orphan. Um, his weakness is he's magic. He doesn't know how to use it. He's famous. He doesn't remember why. He doesn't feel 
loved. Oh, so sad. Poor Harry. And his need is to accept his position in the wizarding world and to embrace his destiny and maintain his capacity to love. No, So heartwarming. Obviously, there are a lot of different ways that you could interpret the weakness need in Ghost. This is not the be all end all. I'm just kind of going off of what I remember about the story. And I listened to it, the Harry Potter at home recently, so I think I'm fairly fresh. Inciting incident or call to adventure is when Harry starts receiving the letters from no one. Also the chapter title. Inciting incident or call to adventure, antagonist enters the in ordinary world, disturbance. Those things are the story grid, which is the inciting incident, and the hero's journey smooshed together. Also anatomy of story has an inciting event, so it's like everything is all the same step. Refusal of the call. Now I debated whether to put this in because you could very much argue that this is a beat and not a structure step. But I do think in terms of character arc and analyzing that, trying to look at the refusal of the call is very is a very good idea. And it is present in so many stories that I, it just, it works here. So I say that the refusal of the call is Uncle Vernon keeping the letters from Harry. Now the reason this is Uncle Vernon's refusal and not Harry's is because Harry is like a good character. He doesn't have a moral weakness. He's just like this nice guy who does the right thing and who would love to read the letters. Uh, revelation turning point is when, progressive complication, um, it's when Hagrid arrives and tells Harry he's a wizard, obviously. We have a crisis, which is not too much of a crisis, but there's definitely, if you read this scene, you feel the point between when Harry's like, this guy is ridiculous, I'm thinking that the Dursleys might be right here, to the point where he's like, oh yeah, I am a wizard. So he's choosing whether or not to believe. And then we have our climax, which is when the desire forms. And that's Harry chooses to leave Hagrid. Now he wants to go to Hogwarts and we see um, him go to Diagon Alley to get his things as our resolution of the beginning hook or the leaving of the ordinary world, if we're thinking of the hero's journey. Hopefully that all made sense. Pretty simple form in the beginning hook. I like beginning hooks. I feel very, fairly good at them. I have a couple of other things here, just questions to think about. So are there other revelations and such? There, yeah, there's definitely a revelation that Dursleys have been lying about how Harry's parents have died, but it's not a structure step because Harry doesn't take any action about that at this time. Uh, we do see introductions. We get Hagrid introduced and he is a mentor as well as Dumbledore. Harry doesn't know him, but he's there. He becomes a mentor. Harry does not take any immoral actions, but if there were immoral actions in a story, this is where that would happen. Middle build one. So first we cross the threshold. Again, harking right on back to our hero's journey. This is such an obvious one for Harry Potter. Platform nine and three quarters and the students arriving at Hogwarts on the boats. Then we have our inciting incident. The inciting incident for this story of the middle build one, I found really difficult because you have to, it's hard to remember that the inciting incident isn't like, we're in the new world. It's, we're in the new world. We get used to the world a little bit and then that world gets disturbed. So for a while I was thinking it could be like, students hearing their band from the third floor corridor, or it could be that like Snape doesn't like Harry but I don't think that's it because those things, when we read them, just seem like they're part of our extraordinary world. They're just part of the new world. You know, Hogwarts is weird. No forest, no third floor. Snape doesn't like Harry. That's pretty, pretty normal and it becomes normal for the books. So I said that the inciting incident, I think it's in chapter seven. It's when Harry realizes that a Gringotts break-in happened the same day he and Hagrid emptied, emptied Vault 713. That's because that's when he starts to wonder what the heck is in that package. Opponent introduction harks back to the anatomy of story. We do meet our opponents in this spot. We meet Malfoy and Snape. Then comes the plan. Harry's initial plan is to learn the rules of the world, learn magic and just fit in. Our opponent's plan, now this is hidden to us for pretty much the entire thing, but 
Voldemort's plan is to use Professor Quirrell to get past Fluffy to steal the Philosopher's Stone. They first try this by brute force, but eventually focus on tricking the Guardians, i.e. professors, into divulging how to get past the obstacles. Then we have Harry's drive. Generally, in some stories, there are immoral actions here. Harry is not an immoral prota protagonist. He's learning the wizarding world, so he's just kind of trying to fit in. He's doing what the teachers say. We get to the apparent defeat, which is kind of our midpoint. This happens in chapter nine, eight or nine. And uh, it's not an apparent defeat, but I think the, the term turning point, revelation, or first ordeal is a really good term for this point in the story. This is when Harry rescues Neville's Remember All, which is a big turning point because it's his first big confrontation with Malfoy. It also marks the point where Harry goes from being a fish out of water um, to where we see his ability and potential to be a great wizard, and his status goes up in the wizarding world tremendously. We also then um, have Malfoy challenge Harry to a duel, which gives us a big crisis of this act, should Harry accept Malfoy's duel or not. Our climax and midpoint shift is that uh, they realize it was a trap. So Harry, Ron, and Neville rush to get away from Filch. They stumble into the three-headed dog and then they escape. And our resolution is Hermione points out the dog was standing on a trap door and they want to figure out what the dog was hiding. Again, this is not really an apparent defeat because <laughs> Harry is not defeated at all. Neville's kind of defeated, but it's a big first ordeal. It's the first real encounter with antagonism that's like a direct encounter. There have been different interpretations of this, and if you disagree, I would love to hear about it. Let me know. Let's move on to middle build three. So I said that the inciting incident, middle build three, middle build two, the inciting incident of this um, is at the Halloween fest feast when Quirrell announces the troll. This is a long inciting incident, but Harry and Ron rescue Hermione in the girls' bathroom, and then they become friends. So I said that this is the inciting incident of this act because we're looking at the at the like the, the story spine, which is really about that package in the Philosopher's Stone. And this is an inciting incident for Harry and Ron because once they get Hermione on board, they're able to. Uh, better go after the stone, better solve the mystery. Without Hermione, they were kind of flandering, but when she comes on, girl power, she, she pushes them forward, and that is actually what doubles their ability to fight against the forces of antagonism, because Hermione is awesome, and maybe I'm a little biased. Mm. Okay, obsessive drive would be, um, again, continuing to fight back against the opponent. So at the Quidditch match, when they think Snape is cursing Harry and Hermione stops him, when they're desperately searching through the library to figure out who Nicholas Flamel is, uh, Harry overhears Snape talking to people. Then we have our turning point progressive complication, which is when they realize the dog is guarding the Philosopher's Stone and they realize what it is. That happens around just after Christmas. Okay, the crisis here was confusing to me. Uh, there's not a huge crisis here, but I think that the crisis, because this this is a big moment in the story and this propels the rest of the action, but it feels a little half-baked. But anyways, I'm saying that the crisis is when Hagrid hatches Norbert from the egg and the kids have to decide whether to help Hagrid or not and how to do that. Oh, sorry, and then the climax is when the kids are caught. So this part of the story has never really sat well with me because Harry and his friends are doing a really good thing. They're helping Hagrid. They weren't the ones who got the illegal dragon. They didn't give it to him. They didn't hatch it in their fireplace. They're just trying to help their friend. And then they get caught and they get detention. And no one ever is like, excuse me, Hagrid, you're taking us to detention. This is your fault. Did you realize that we were trying to help you? Like that part has never really gone through my head. And there's a line in the book where it says Harry and Hermione thought they deserved what they got, but they didn't do anything wrong. They were just trying to help Hagrid not go to jail. So I, it's not a real crisis. And I, that part of the story has never worked for me. Anyways, the climax of this act is obviously when they're caught and serving detention, Harry encounters Voldemort and is nearly killed big standoff with opponent. There's a visit to death here. And um, in the set, the middle build 
two, I think the resolution is the visit to death. This is different than the apparent defeat because it's like the heroes get a glimpse of death. It's like the thing that they've been fearing happens. It's a big, big stakes moment. Again, this is from the anatomy of story that separates the apparent defeat and the visit to death. I really like that separation here the centaur saves harry's life which doesn't seem like a visit to death but harry realizes that voldemort is the one after the stone and he is working through someone and he literally expects voldemort to come in and kill him at any moment so this is his like big visit to death of holy cow and he really starts to understand what it means that his parents were killed by voldemort then we have our ending payoff Woo! we're almost at the end so the inciting incident of the ending payoff is hagrid tells them how to get past fluffy just kind of in a in a conversation there in the pub he says oh you play a wee bit of music okay so i structured the ending payoff differently the ending payoff is when everything is paying off literally so we're getting new information super super quick where there's new actions being taken decision after decision after decision that are propelling us to the end so instead of phrasing this in like the normal progressive complication, the ending payoff, I just have revelation and decision, revelation and decision, revelation and decision, because I think in really good stories, you just have this huge revelation sequence and the ending payoff that propels you forward. That's why this act looks really different. This is just the structure that makes sense to my head though, right? So other people structure it differently. This is how I'm structuring it for how I analyze things. And it makes a lot of sense. So we have a revelation. They realize Hagrid told the man who gave him the dragon's egg how to get past Fluffy. Therefore, Voldemort knows how to get past everything. Decision, Harry decides to go to Dumbledore. Revelation, Dumbledore is gone. Decision, they're gonna go after the stone themselves. Revelation, uh, there's a couple revelations in this sequence and actions where Hermione and Ron kind of show their gifts. So when Neville shows up and tries to stop them, Hermione decides to hex Neville when they're playing the chess game and um, they get to a, a scary point, Ron decides to sacrifice himself to get Harry and Hermione through. There's a final revelation here where Hermione reveals that only one of them can go forward to the stone and they decide that Harry will go forward and Hermione will stay back. Again, I have a question here. It's order <laughs> so it's which is first the battle the self-revelation when the character realizes what they've been doing wrong and learns how to act in the world or whatever and the moral decision sometimes the moral decision isn't present sometimes it is but those things can differ like some books will say the self-revelation should be before the battle so they go into the battle with the self-revelation and then the moral decision happens during the battle whereas in some books there's the battle and the battle causes the self-revelation and therefore they make the moral decision. In other books, there's the battle and the moral decision happens like before the battle and they have the revelation after the battle, but it's like too late. So I just have them in order here. It's fairly straightforward. We have the battle, which is when um, it's in the deep basement when Harry is facing off against Quirrell and Voldemort in front of the mirror. Then we have our self-revelation, which is, you could say it's when Harry realizes the stone is in his pocket, which is a demonstration of his power and his gift, which is his ability to love. You get even more of the self-revelation afterwards when Dumbledore is talking to him. There is no real moral decision here, but Dumbledore does provide us with a lot of moral dialogue about continuing to fight evil, even if you can never fully push it down. It does answer the question, how should we act in the world and so what? So it kind of counts as the moral part of the story. And finally, we're at the new equilibrium where Gryffindor wins the house cup and everyone heads home for the summer. Okay. So that is our story analysis. Oh my God, that was so tiring. Okay, so <laughs> I hope that this was maybe possibly um, a little bit helpful or interesting. I would love to hear what kinds of story structure resources you use. I know that there are there are literally tons. I've heard of six acts, 15 acts. I haven't actually heard of 15 acts. I'm just making that up. But I'm sure I'm sure it exists. If you know a 15 act structure, I don't I don't want to. I have enough. There's already so many things in my head. I don't want to make any more forms. But I am anticipating that this will change and I'm really excited to use this form to analyze a whole bunch of stories and try to figure out why they work or why I don't like them or why I do like them and talk about the little nuances in future videos. This is really just like a primer for that. So um, that is how I created that form. Yeah, well, if you got to the end of this video, congratulations, good job, please let me know. I will send you virtual chocolate.
<laughs> Have a great uh, day and thanks. I'll see you next time. <laughs>